Hello, I'm Betty Farrell, and as chair of this study and of this committee meeting, I'd like to welcome everyone. The task being undertaken by this committee of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine is to examine how our nation delivers, finances, regulates, and measures the quality of nursing home care. The committee's full official statement of task can be found on the project website. We would also like to thank the sponsors of this very important study. The committee members are listed on the screen. I would also like to remind everyone that this is an information gathering session. Therefore, I ask that everyone here today be extremely mindful of the fact that the committee has made no conclusions and that it would be a mistake for anyone to leave here today thinking otherwise. Comments that will be made by individuals, including members of the committee, should not be interpreted as positions of the committee or of the academies. In addition, committee members typically ask probing questions in these information gathering sessions that may not be indicative of their personal views. We are also inviting residents, family members, and nursing home staff to submit their stories and experiences, which are also so important to the committee. Today's webinar will be recorded and archived at the link shown on the screen. I want to note that this is an open, on the record session. Individuals from the public have been invited to attend as observers and we will not be entertaining questions from the floor. Please do note, however, that anyone can submit testimony or other materials to the committee at any time. And these documents will be placed into the committee's public access file. You can submit this information through the project website. Today's webinar will explore a variety of perspectives. We have given each speaker only 10 minutes for their remarks. I kindly ask the speakers to be respectful of this time so that we can have time for ample discussion with the committee members. I would like to now introduce the moderator of this session, Dr. Reginald Tucker Seeley. Thank you, Betty. We're very excited to have our three speakers here with us today. Um, we have Karen Schonerman from Karen Schonerman Consulting, Dr. Arif Nazir, Chief Medical Officer, Signature Healthcare, and Dr. Margaret Calkins, Board Chair, Ideas Institute, the Center for Health uh, Design. And the full bios for the speakers can be found in the briefing book on the study webpage um, that was mentioned earlier. And so now I'd like to turn it over to Karen Schonerman. I'd like to express my thanks to the National Academies for including me in this important discussion. And I'd like to say hello to a lot of people who are uh, members of the committee whom I know and have worked with for years. I wanted to talk in my few little minutes about something I've been thinking about for a long time, which is I'm calling the missing link to improving nursing homes. It seems like my whole life of more than 50 years in the in the long-term care culture have been about improving nursing homes. And what I have found through both my work as a provider in social services, my work at CMS uh, as a deputy director of the division of nursing homes and my co-foundership of the culture change movement is that the problem remaining is institutional culture. The culture change movement, which actually started in 1997 and had its first nation, national meeting in 99, seeks to change how people think about what they're doing. After over 24 years of the culture change movement though, only several hundred nursing homes have gotten excited, have caught on and made changes and made their places better. And I have visited many places over the years to observe what's going on. We've got many, many more thousands of homes that I'd like to see come aboard to learn a better way of working, to have people who live there and their families and their staff 
uh, have a much better life. Now, CMS has been observing the culture change movement for many years and has actually written changes in their regulatory guidance many times to liberalize things and to foster more dignity and get more specific about it. So after all these years and years and years, what is taking so long to change? I think the thing that I'm thinking about lately is clinical care. And I'm saying clinical care needs to meet culture change. If you wanna to go to a next slide for me. Since I started out my career in my early 20s, working in a nursing home, I find that people seem to follow a book of rules that I think does not actually exist as a real book. Nobody's ever shown me a book, but it resides in the heads of the people, especially the clinicians who are sort of in charge. Nursing and, and medical, for the most part, are in charge. And it sort of goes like, I have the answers in my head as to why do I work here? What are my goals here as a clinical person who's in leadership in this home? It seems to me that over the years, I have found some of these bullets, safety first, safety above all else. We know safety led us to restraining people for a long, long time, and that's pretty much over, but it took like 25 years for that one thing to get over because it was too much safety. It was so much safety, it was harming people. The second thought in the book of rules is medicalize everything. So massage becomes massage therapy. Diets become medical diets, etc. The next one is treat everybody the same. Now that's an old thought that I think from an old director of nursing in one of the jobs I had before I even went to CMS, she actually said to me, we've got to treat everyone the same. So that, I'd say, why? And she'd say, so that if we give somebody something special, everybody will want something special. As going back to the medicalize everything bullet, one of the big ones is restricting diets. And because the medical diets are really famous for removing things that people want and removing salt, removing pizza, removing ice cream sundaes, et cetera, removing a beer and a hot dog in the ball game. And in the book of rules, it's, it's sort of the last thing is that the managers, the leaders, the DONs, the floor nurses, if we still call them that, set the flow of the day for everybody for their staff, who we call now team members in the culture change movement, and for the residents, rather than letting the residents have some control over their own day. So I have retired from CMS in 2012, so it's been a while. If you wanna switch me to the next slide. Um, I have been working uh, with the Pioneer Network and Carmen Bowman to develop a greatly expanded new Artifacts of Culture Change 2.0 tool for nursing homes and a similar one for assisted living. The original Artifacts of Culture Change listed concrete changes that culture changing leader homes have successfully changed. The new one sort of doubles the number of things because those leaders have changed many more things and it was just released literally a few weeks ago. And it's on the pioneernetwork.net website under the heading of tools. These tools are guides for other nursing homes who wanna get excited and move toward a better life for residents, families, and staff. And to move forward into not only resident-directed care, but into thinking in a culture changed way rather than the old institutional way. Many items on both of the tools, but especially on the nursing home tool, echo actual language that CMS has written into their regulatory guidelines as they have gone through these projects of um, liberalizing the guidelines and explaining things more. For example, in the next slide, the dining practice standards. Um, I was responsible for coming up with the idea of two national symposia in 2008 and 10 
The first one was on the uh, culture change in the environment. The second was on the culture change and food and dining. Out of that second one, a national task force came about for many months of standard setting organizations that uh, uh, give guidance as to how do we practice. There were medical directors and dietitians and nurses and advocates and CMS sat in on this. What happens is um, the dietitians were reporting research saying default to the normal diet for people who are older and in long-term care because the medical diet causes weight loss. It causes frustration. It causes a failure to thrive or even want to come and eat your meal. So with the research and with the release of the dining practice standards, which I think was in 2011, CMS went along with writing regulatory guidance in their nutrition regulatory tag to say, yeah, go liberalize the diets for just about everybody, except maybe those one or two people who are so medically fragile that you'll hurt them. But after all these years, 2011, now we're in 2021, medical diets are still the default in most places. That gets back to the big book, the big book of rules that's not really a book that says, oh, Let's have a medical diet here. This person has diabetes. Clinicians are not being trained even on this one simple thing that was a national consensus of standard setting organizations, including the nurses and doctors and dietitians. The clinicians are not being trained this way, whether it's in their original training or in their CEU training. And I say, why? I don't know. I'm a social service person. I'm not a nurse, doctor, or dietitian. So next slide. I've been asked to talk about the survey process. I co-led the survey process through much of its development for the 22 years that I was at CMS, through many changes, through many attempts to try to capture what the regulations meant, how to comply with them, how to survey them as surveyors, and how to improve nursing homes by finding out where they are failing. The surveyors now need to expect to see things like adherence to the dining practice standards and many other clinical changes to institutional culture, but they they're not there yet. They haven't been trained in that domain as well. They need to become familiar with the items on the artifacts tool, which is sort of like a handy dandy guidebook toward good stuff for quality of life and quality of care. So I say, why aren't the surveyors doing that? They haven't been uh, set free to do it. They haven't been trained to do it. And a lot of them come from long-term care and institutional ways following that big book in the head seems normal. So they need to be trained in the changes just like clinicians need to. And then I will close by saying maybe the National Academies can help, which is my last slide. Maybe they can help by themselves becoming familiar with culture changes specified in this tool, push educational entities who are providing training, education and CEUs to look at their own teachings, to get rid of institutional practices being the preferred thing and help make the long-term care field and the public aware of how much better life can be. I told you at the beginning that I was sort of the leading thinker behind two national symposia. I think it's time for a third national symposium, which I will call clinical care meets culture change. Perhaps the national academies can help. And thank you. Great. Great, thank you, Karen Schoenerman, for that engaging presentation. So our next presentation will be Dr. Arif Nazir. Thank you, respectable committee members for this invitation. Uh, my committee comments today represent my own views as a clinician and an advocate in this setting and not of the organization that I associate with. I believe that our consistent failures in nursing home quality stem not from the negligence of a few, but the lack of rational thinking and evidence based in our overall system design. This notion is validated by the disappointing results from many well-funded and well-thought-out trials, such as the INTERACT trial in 2017, and more recently, the proven trial that aimed to improve quality by focusing on staff training around advanced care planning. Their results highlighted that even with additional funding and expertise, current nursing home environments make it impossible to implement and improve quality. 
Simply more of everything, for example, funding, regulations, citations, and staffing is not going to suffice as a solution. The qualification of the esteemed committee members uh, makes me hopeful that this time around, we will finally move away from band-aid workarounds that have prominently relied in the past on blame, reactivity, and anecdotes to address quality. Let us be clear, not all CEOs are greedy. No, not all physicians are saints. And no, not all REITs are targeting seniors to get rich. And let it be known that overwhelming majority of stakeholders, regardless of their roles or affiliation, want the best for our residents and present our biggest advantage and chance in our pursuit of improved quality. By the end of my comments, I hope to have convinced the committee of one main recommendation. That is, improving quality of our nursing homes requires a complete evidence-based redesign of every aspect of the system, including care delivery systems, teamwork, leadership, physical upgrades, etc. Now I present my four points building my case. Number one, Nursing home quality agenda has been hijacked by regulatory checklists. During a recent visit to a nursing home, I ran into a passionate nurse who had just shifted her role from frontline nurse to a training staff. Even though she missed her clinical role immensely, she explained to me that in her frontline role, she took pride in providing meaningful services to her residents. For example, she was in demand among residents for her makeup and her hairdo skills. But then a new supervisor started reprimanding her for these unessential tasks that were keeping her from the real work. She got so discontented that she thought about quitting and ended up making the transition to a non-clinical position. I wish I could say that this was a rare story, but I would be wrong. Since then, I have reflected on this a lot and can easily relate. As a geriatrician, I always needed to spend time and establish a deep connection with my residents just to transcend into what I call a zone and where I can literally visualize the resident as a person in their own environment. This visualization and knowing of the real patient person behind the patient is key to best possible care task-based and cookie cutter processes that distract clinicians from and interrupt them from building this connection become a key barrier to person-centered care. Please don't get me wrong. We do need regulatory structures for assuring standardization and accountability in many areas. For example, environmental standards, campus safety, temperature limits on food, professional conduct, et cetera. But when these frameworks impinge on clinician-patient connection, they become problematic. Number two, outdated accountability systems. Our nursing homes don't have a carrot and a stick accountability system, but rather a stick and then more sticks accountability system. When we rely on a system that directly employs regulatory citations and deep financial penalties and indirectly employs reputational threats and humiliation through overused litigatory process to make healthcare teams do the right thing, we propagate the notion that the majority of team members are knaves rather than well-deserving knights. I highlighted this very critical issue in my edit editorial titled, No One Cares When Planes Don't Crash, that published in Journal of American Medical Director Association last year. There are many unintended consequences in a society that uses such an approach, most importantly, demotivating and losing passionate healthcare workers. As a nursing home doctor, I have spent thousands of hours on nursing units, observing hundreds of staff members provide compassionate care. During some of this time, I was accompanied by state surveyors also observing the same staff, assuring that they were in regulatory compliance. Unfortunately, their lengthy checklists lacked any sections to capture staff compassion, meaningful conversations, gentle touches, smiles, or hugs, instead had all their focus on a gotcha approach, waiting to cite on any inevitable omission from the most complex care protocols, many of no clinical consequence. Our mission-driven frontline staff need to be acknowledged for the hardest jobs on the planet, rather than blamed for unfortunate, but most of the times inevitable outcomes among patients. Number three, broken quality measurement system that does not translate in a positive change. From MACRA, MIPS, alternate payment models to nursing home compare five-star rating systems, our quality systems fail to deliver. In the ambitious attempts to translate complex care into sample, simple dashboards, we have created inaccurate and irrelevant metrics that are conducive to gaming, particularly for those with resources. This strategy has created a parallel digital universe of care, overshadowing realities our residents and their care partners face. In many cases, these measures distract from quality. For example, every day physicians spend hours and healthcare systems waste billions to prove their artificial worth. Thousands of startups and analytic companies have benefited from this digital universe of so-called quality. If these systems were truly about quality, we would have seen a sharp increase in startups to enhance staff competencies, teamwork, and customer service instead. For creating meaningful quality measures, we should take lessons from others. For example, if you visit a restaurant, would you care about the chef's operational performance in the kitchen or about the flavor of the steak, its temperature and timeliness of service? Let us move away from meaningless quality measures such as use of cholesterol lowering pill in a frail patient that may help achieve physician achieve exceptional score for MIPS months after care was delivered, but fails to nudge them to really listen to their patient and families when it really mattered. Number four. 
Passionate advocacy is important, but not enough to improve quality. My 86-year-old grandmother in Pakistan has been my friend, guide, and advocate for as long as I remember. We still talk regularly on many topics, for example, faith, family gossip, technology, and of course, healthcare. A few weeks ago, she called me, pleading for me not to accept the COVID-19 vaccine. She had heard that immigrants were being prioritized to study vaccine safety. Obviously, she was mistaken, and here I am, blessed to have received the vaccine. Sometimes people who are advocating for our best interests may not have all the right answers. To best solutions every single time, we need to rely on available evidence. Can you imagine the outcome if a cardiologist, instead of using best available evidence, waited to hear from all family members and then waited for their agreement before treating unstable angina? How about if Centers for Disease Control and Prevention had waited for consensus among all well-intended stakeholders before implementing a ban on nursing home visitation early in the pandemic? We have had a pandemic of poor care design, delivery, and outcomes in a nursing home for decades. Unfortunately, we have been paralyzed by lack of consensus among caring stakeholders whose li lives have continued to be lost. We would have never accepted this kind of inaction if younger lives were at stake. Ageism comes in many forms, and paternalism that results in inaction is as harmful as any overt form of ageism. So what can we do to improve nursing home quality? Before I make a few suggestions, I would like to note my support for key solutions already presented by many panelists on this and previous webinars, particularly by Robert Kramer, Mike, Dr. Mike Wasserman, and also in the Care for Our Senior Act, a proposal recently put forth by ACA and Leading Age. Some examples they give include clinical care enhancement, workforce upgrades, modern and safer buildings, transparency, smart use of technology, and more engaged medical teams and medical directors. Now, here are five areas I believe are fundamental for getting us the needed solutions. Number one, upgrade in survey and accountability systems. While the surveyors should monitor and when needed, cite nursing homes on issues of structural and operational compliance, monitoring for high quality care delivery and improvements should instead be tasked to other quality improvement organizations that use supportive and coaching, approach, uh, coaching approaches. A detailed conversation, conversation on this topic is beyond the scope of my report, but has been laid out in the AMDA position statement published by me and other colleagues in December, 2020. Number two, using behavioral economics and related strategies for quality improvement and change. Years of research from Dr. Dan Ariely and other behavioral economists have shown clearly that unless you are in the business of flipping burgers or chopping wood, superficial incentive frameworks, financial or social only distract from quality. Instead, as noted by Daniel Pink in his book, Thrive, quality required internal motivation of the team, which in turn needs for us to reimburse people fairly, empower them for purpose-driven conduct, provide system for interprofessional training and mastery, and finally, give them the autonomy to meet the set expectations. Number three, quality, rel relevant quality measures with timely and meaningful incentives. When Mrs. Smith passes away peacefully at a nursing, nursing home that was her home, thanks to the efforts and care of all team members and her son, who was always present at the bedside, everyone on the team, including the frontline aides and the son should be acknowledged and rewarded. A system of meaningful measures that promote staff purpose and helps them to be rewarded as a byproduct of good care will cut burnout and turnover. Number four, discard burdensome documentation systems. Our teams waste precious time on burdensome documentation just to feed our outdated accountability and reimbursement systems and to keep away circling litigators. This takes them away from investing in patient family connection, adding to frustration and discontent at work, at job. We need to use technologies to automate the documentation and provide real-time analytics and outcomes for prompt decision-making when the care is being actively delivered. Number five and final, Focus on wellness and purpose in our nursing homes. Nursing homes can't be perceived as places where people come to die. There's emerging evidence on wellness strategies such as creative engagement, music, volunteerism, spirituality. We need to design reimbursement mechanisms to implement such programs properly and then invest in high quality and inclusive research to study their impact. Investment in wellness and purpose care driven is long overdue. My esteemed committee members, to conclude, I would say that we are at major crossroads and we cannot let this pandemic cri crisis, induced crisis go waste. Time has come for once and all that we explore and address the ageism, most notably the inherent paternalism in our healthcare system. We need a redesign, we need a total redesign of our post-acute care system, not just in the physical space, but in many other areas, such as how we keep our teams motivated and engaged and how we provide purpose for our residents. This will require shedding of the blame and use of most current evidence base to overhaul all our accountability systems, promote interprofessional learning, and re-envision our quality metrics and incentive programs. Thank you so much for your time. Great, thank you, Dr. Nazir. And our next presentation is Dr. Margaret Calkins.
Thank you. And I'd like to also thank the committee uh, and the previous two speakers. I agree with everything they have said. And I really do hope that this series of uh, webinars that you are putting on can help us make a difference in our long term care environments. I'm really talking about the physical environment in this section. Um, and we know that environment makes a difference. Some of the earliest research that was done in healthcare settings on the environment um, showed that when people who were recovering from gallbladder surgery had a window that had a view out to green space and nature, they were released uh, sh sooner, they had a shorter length of stay, they used less narcotic medications and went on to analgesics much more quickly. Their quality of their notes from the nursing staff were much better. They were um, more compliant and, and content with the post-surgery process over people who had had exactly the same surgery, but whose windows overlooked a building and a wall instead of the green space. So we know that environment and nature makes a difference. I ask you to look at these images. Where do you want to live? Many people in long-term care live there for months or years. And even if you're in short-term rehab, being in a place that feels more like a home is going to help you recover and be prepared for moving back home than in doing your rehabilitation in a setting that has no relevance to what you are living at at home. And I say that as you look at these two buildings and these entrances, your psyche as you walk into this building is in a totally different frame of reference. Next slide. And it doesn't have to be just from the outside inside the building. We see these entrances inside. It's the sort of the hallmark of what makes a household model. There are many components and I'm gonna talk about several of them, but you look at the entrance on the left and that's the typical traditional institutional entrance into the hallway. This is a uh, moon crescent hallway. And yet you walk into that and there is nothing that feels positive or comforting or um, engaging for the residents or for the staff or the families. As opposed to the image on the right, which is, again, inside of a building, there are seven different households and each one has a uniquely different front door. You have a totally different set of expectations in going through that front door. It changes your mindset. It changes the mindset of the residents who live there. They view this as their home. It is their territory. We know from years of psychological research that having your own space in your territory and feeling that you have some control over it is fundamental for positive well-being and, and cognitive health. Um, and you don't get that in the image on the left. Let's go to the next image. Um, we also need to be thinking about environments that are enriched, that support the kinds of engagement and meaningful purposeful um, activities that uh, Arif was, was talking about and Karen was talking about. The image on the left, there is just nothing to do except sit there and you know twiddle your thumbs. You might be able to look outside, but in fact, it looks like it's a parking lot outside. Whereas the image on the right shows you what an enhanced environment looks like. You've got people who are working in the kitchen, who are preparing the food so that you get the sounds of the food and the aroma of the food, which stimulates appetite and encourages people to be able to eat and hydrate more independently than when the food is prepared somewhere else and just brought and put down maybe on a tray or maybe just taken off of the tray. They bring the tray to the table and they take the food off and stick it in front of you. That's not a way that is going to support residents' engagement in the meal process. Um, being able to participate in the food preparation is something that is very important. These are people who, many of whom, spent their lives preparing their meals uh, all, all of the time. And then to suddenly have that taken away from them, it's, it's, it's ripping away their meaning and their purpose and their ways of contributing 
to their life, to their community. Next slide, please. Just another example of what we see in so many care communities still are these totally impoverished spaces with nothing to do versus the one on the right. This is a Montessori example where there are always things that people can pull out and do independently or with each other. Um, they have a mindset that brings um, meaningful activities uh, in one community. The residents living with dementia make big heart-shaped pillows, which they then donate to the cancer hospital down the street for women who've had mastectomies. Because when you get into a car after having a mastectomy, the seatbelt really hurts. And so they have this big heart-shaped pillow. And this is a program that the residents with dementia are doing and contributing positively to their community. But it takes an environment, along with the mindset of the staff, that supports that engagement. It's going to be better and easier to do when you have a whole environment that is working towards the same kinds of goals. So a household model has a front door, it has a kitchen, it has a smaller scale number of people, usually 16 or less. It means the scale of the spaces are smaller as well. They are more familiar. They aren't as cavernous and large and institutional as you see in a lot of other settings. Next image. So you can have people continuing to do meaningful things throughout the day. And whether it is as I was talking about the pillows, whether it is helping with the food preparation. I mean, everybody eats three or four times, two or three or four times a day. Um, being able to continue to contribute to that effort is important to a lot of people. And it only happens when you really have, or it, it happens better when you have the support, like the kitchen, to enable it to happen on a regular basis. We have states that have regulations that say you must have a kitchen, but you have to lock the refrigerator away from people because somebody with diabetes might go in and eat all of the ice cream. There are other ways of managing these kinds of issues that have some real um, value for discussion about how do we manage it, but just locking it away is a mindset of surplus safety. So on the next slide, I'm going to talk about some of the research that has been done that clearly shows the benefits of smaller groups of residents in a household type setting. There have been at least four different studies that have shown that these communities that have a household model with fewer numbers of residents have had significantly fewer cases of positive COVID-19 in the residents, um, and to some extent, some lesser uh, even in the staff. They have had fewer deaths from COVID. So zero per 100 positive cases in the research project that was looking at the greenhouse small house model that Dr. Cheryl Zimmerman uh, led the effort on versus 10 to 12 deaths per 100 positive cases in the more traditional settings. And some of those were not great big settings. Those were smaller than 50 beds uh, communities, but they operated in a institutional traditional model, not in this household model. Um, there have been reduced hospitalizations, and this is in a pre-COVID era, um, which results in Medicare and Medicaid savings, sometimes quite substantial savings. Um, they have higher occupancy rates. Um, which produces more revenue for the care communities with quite similar operational costs. Um, there may be some slight differences in the initial upfront construction costs, but it tends to uh, wash out when you're looking at the um, higher occupancy rates. And the higher revenue is regardless of whether you are serving or the proportion of residents that you are serving who are using Medicaid services. Household models have significantly higher satisfaction rates for residents, for families, and for staff 
which often leads to less staff turnover. And we know that staff turnover is a, a huge issue in long-term care. Um, many communities are having to um, use 20 to 30 percent uh, agency staff because they can't maintain their own staff. If you can show that having a smaller household model can result in higher staff satisfaction and less staff turnover at $16,000 average cost to replace a CNA, that's a lot of money that you can be saving and pouring back into your household model. Um, agency staff often cost twice as much as line staff that you have actually hired. Um, and household models have equivalent or better clinical outcomes. Um, when this process first started back in the 2000s and 2s and 3s with the first greenhouse models, um, there was a lot of concern that the clinical outcomes were not going to be equivalent. How could you do it with 10 people? And in fact, the data is very clear that the outcomes are similar or better. And I will leave it at that. Thank you. Great. Well, I'd like to thank all three of our speakers for those very engaging presentations. Um, so next we'll move to committee questions um, from our, or questions from our committee members. Um, and so I would like to ask our committee members to please use the raise your hand function um, and I will, um, I will call on you. Um, please, when, when you're called on, check your mute status to make sure that you are unmuted and also please turn on your camera. Um, and as the moderator, I will uh, take the first question. So we know, and, and this question is for any of our, of our panelists, so we know that race and socioeconomic resources substantially influences one's experience in, in nursing homes. So how do we ensure that, that for the changes that you've recommended, that they are not exacerbating health disparities and that we are equally um, distributing any of the benefits that could be noted in the changes that you recommend? I'm happy to start with it. Uh, thank you for that great question. I mean, the issue you bring up has just been highlighted so much recently and uh, uh, continues to be a huge, huge issue in many aspects of healthcare. And I, I think some of the, I, to me, if we follow the evidence, evidence has been there telling us about exacerbate, uh, about crisis always exacerbates issues of equality. We know that, right? I mean, my, my big concern and thesis of my talk today was that we have turned a blind eye to clear evidence around many, many issues. Uh, big ones being how you regulate people's behavior, how you motivate people to do better. You know, when, when you just turn your eyes blind to evidence and just believe, start believing that just intensity, pushing people hard and more funding, more staffing are the solutions, they will always exacerbate issues around <laughs> diversity, equality, and all those kind of things. So that's the beauty of evidence that these things adjust uh, if you've really used research in, in making some decisions. So I think my answer is going to be the same. Let's stop being parents to our seniors and our frail patients, let's go back to what we always do for, for the care of the younger, is that we really keep evidence based in the middle of every decision making and things kind of turn out better. So, so that's my quick answer. Uh, yeah. I'll just add that some people on the environmental side see these images of the small house as small, independent, freestanding buildings. And they say in urban areas, we can't do that. Therefore, we'll just build the old institution. Um, there are a number of examples of multi-story household models. It's just a matter of how you design the space so that you can do this in an urban area um, just as easily as you can do it out in a rural area as well. Okay. Uh, Karen, did you have a comment on the on the question before we move to the panelist question or the committee uh, questions? I'm good. Okay, so our first committee member is um, Colleen. Um, you have your hand raised. I do. Thank you. Yep. Um, I actually have. Um, I'm trying to get at this um, in a, a different way. I'm looking at psychosocial care, so I have a different question for Karen and Arif, um, and one for uh, Margaret. So Margaret, um, my question for you is, what is the highest number of residents that can be housed in a nursing home while still having a smaller household model effect? You had uh, talked about nine to 14, but I'm wondering from a design perspective, can the same effect be achieved using pods or wings of like nine to 14 people 
um, that are kind of uh, self-contained. Um, so let's start with that one. And then I have another question for uh, Arif and Karen. Okay, um, absolutely. As I was just saying in response to the, to the last question, you can do multi-story buildings. Um, this has been done in communities that serve more than a hundred people. You just put 10 houses together, each house holds, accommodates 10, 12, you know, the, there's no um, absolute magic number for what's the tipping point for the largest size for a household. In general, it's thought to be 16 is the max. Once you're above 16, you don't feel like a household anymore. There are others who would argue it really needs to be closer to 12, maybe 13. It's not a magic number, but you can certainly combine them together uh, in a single building um, and uh, still have each one operate independently so that you get that household model. Wonderful, thank you. And for Karen and Arif, um, you had talked about well-being and you talked about engagement. You talked about um, moving away from the medical model and really uh, looking at how to enhance purpose um, for those residents living in nursing homes. So what are your specific recommendations for developing environments and practices that enhance optimal social activities and psychological well-being? Well, uh... You want to start, Arif? Go ahead. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm not the expert on it, but I mean, I've seen the benefits of the projects I've been part of. For example, uh, our organization, Signature Healthcare, has been working with an organization, non-for-profit organization, Time Slips, um, uh, which basically they bring creative engagement uh, uh, in the nursing homes, and they bring communities through creative engagement into nursing homes. And uh, for example, they have professional artists coming in and doing plays where actually the residents are the, are the, are the prime actors. And I will tell you that, I, have, I mean, if you go and see the videos of some of those things, it is just unbelievable that how community point of view changes about nursing homes very quickly. So, so I think there are many different ways of doing it. There's of course, IT based ways of doing it. There's many products out there that enhance creative engagement use, using AI, using patient history, but every single one of them will require one very basic tenant. We need to know our people. You know, if you do not know your residents and they are just a number for you and they're just one of those people who are gonna follow your directions to make sure that your service results are good and they become a, 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 a way for you to get to five-star rating and good reimbursement, then those stories behind those people are never gonna come out. So as a community, we need to make a decision. Are you gonna go on that very different path, which is absolutely 180 degrees from where we are today. So that's why in my pitch, I propose that I hope this very smart committee members kind of scratch what we're doing at this point and really look at the evidence around teamwork, motivation, and every single one of those evidence pieces, again, we don't have enough evidence because we never really cared about too much about that in nursing homes, unfortunately. But if we do kind of start implementing it, we have to research it, but we will find out that talking to the patient and understanding them who they are, what their needs are going to be the most important thing, which we need to figure out first and then everything else will fall into place. Thank you. Hello, Colleen. I have had a hobby for many years of actually going to innovative culture changing homes. Some of them were household models, some of them were not. And what I find is this, when team members and residents and families get together, they are ready for psychosocial connections. And the only thing that is in their way is institutional practices and schedules and thoughts. So if everybody has to rush to get everybody dressed to go to breakfast, which is one hour and it is when it is, and they lock it when it's done, then they are put upon. So people who are well-meaning are dying to know more about Millie and help her get her earrings on and her lipstick before she goes there. So getting loosening the institutional structure sets people free to do what we do. If we, the people who are on this Zoom, we're actually in a room, we would start socializing with each other. It's just inevitable. And it's only COVID that has stopped us for a while, but we're eager to get there. So the, the aides especially are put upon by the system. The nurse is put upon by the system because, well, the dining room is locked and the food service manager thinks you should lock the dining room. So the diabetic people don't get everything and cardiac people don't 
suck on salt or whatever we used to think that people used to do when we were silly and way too safe. So the answer is we just have to set people free to be what people always have been. Thank you Great. so much. And so our next question comes from uh, Kathy Greenlee. Thank you very much, Reggie. I have a question for Karen. And I want to say hello to Karen because it's been 100 million years since I saw Karen. Karen, I have a question about survey. Um, those of us on the committee certainly understand the current limitations that are placed on survey with regard to it being a quality assurance process. The goal is not to send someone out to do a lot of um, teaching with nursing homes. That really falls to the QIO. So mm -hmm. I was interested in your comments about how the nursing home surveyors and that process can facilitate culture change without crossing that, that line, you know, what, what are the things that surveyors are currently doing to facilitate culture change? And what are the impediments in that process that we should be aware of? And it is so nice to see you, Kathy. I have many fond memories of you over the years, helping out, even being at a pioneer network and, and being at one of the national symposia. Um, the survey process started in 1990 with the regulations that enacted OBRA. So here we are 30 years later, CMS has tried desperately to move along, move the surveyors along so that they could move the homes along. And I think we got to say to ourselves at this point, there's only so much that an evaluator, a surveyor can do. Perhaps the only thing that I would hope that they would want to do is actually pass out the artifacts tool and say, Go on the Pioneer Network and look at the videos that go with this and look at how you could change. But they are not there to do teaching. And I, I agree with you totally. It's the QIOs that need to pick up on it. As we know, um, the QIOs do like a three-year-long scope of work. And I'm assuming they're still doing that. Maybe they're not. Maybe they've run out of money. But we did have one culture change scope of work in which they worked with several hundred nursing homes in, uh, oh my gosh, it must feel like 12 years ago. I would hope they would do that again, focused on what is institutional culture and how to get rid of it. Can I, can I make a quick comment too, please? Yes. I uh, just want to quickly add, uh, just to uh, Kathy is like, and I'm sure Kathy, you know that, I mean, life just doesn't work that way. Like this is a beautiful compartment of, re you know, servers are going to do this and the quality improvement is people are going to do this. When care is being delivered in a complex environment where you got multiple people who are who need care and there's a couple acute issues, new admissions rolling in, everything is blurred. What gets priority in your mind, you think, in a staff member's mind? What what really stays as a priority? It's the it's the it's the it's the service process, it's the regulatory checklist which always wins whenever crisis happens. And there's crisis in a nursing home every other minute. I don't know a nursing home where there's no crisis. So just thinking about this, like, oh, this is a beautiful world, black and white. And here's the, you know, this category of survey process and this category of QIO. I wish it worked that way, but unfortunately it, it doesn't that work that way. And, uh, you know, I've, and that's just from my personal opinion, you know, being in many, many nursing homes providing care. Okay, our, our, uh, Kathy, did you have a follow-up? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I could say, um, I was just trying to characterize, as I understand it currently, the way that the rules are. I mean, this committee is hearing all of your input about um, what everybody thinks they should be. But there is that stark division right now, and that's what I was trying to articulate. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. So our next question comes from Philip Sloan. Thank you. And thank you to all of our presenters for um, all the wonderful work that you've done and, um, and your terrific presentations. I actually have two questions. I'm gonna say them both at once so that the reviewers can, I mean, the presenters can um, more efficiently either respond or not. The first is, was really made, aimed at Karen's comments, but I think everyone may have a comment, which is, you know, how, you know, you really talked about how the providers, the people who are working in the nursing homes have a significant responsibility for the care that's provided and kind of being part of the problem. My question is, how can we keep them from being fearful and therefore motivated by fear of quality measurement, you know, the tendency of funding to medicalize, because if you want to have a massage therapy, you got to pay for it, you have a massage, you know, the lawyers, the surveyors, the media, and all these things that make people scared. That was question one. And the question two is very different. You know, it has to do with, you know, back one of the things that OBRA 87 did was decide that 
we could, shouldn't certify separately skilled care and intermediate care, what it was called back then, you know, and have things evolve to the point where, you know, we know that nursing homes compete for the post-acute care, but post-acute settings really are very different, you know, than you know, creating a home and getting families engaged and all that kind of thing, you know, should these two things be separated, you know, maybe with post-acute care under the, you know, within some, somehow affiliated with hospitals and working to make nursing homes really homes. So those are my two questions. Hi, Phil. It's so nice to see you on this uh, group. Uh, you are such a deep thinker. I think we're trying to bite an elephant and swallow the whole thing. And we can only do a few hairs on its tail at a time. And that's what we've been after for 30 years, isn't it? So before all of us are old enough to be dead, we have to make some progress somewhere. It's some more of these bites. Let's bite an ankle or a kneecap or something. I don't know. I don't have any particular answers because uh, your questions are always so deep. So I'll throw it out to whoever thinks they could do it. I don't, I don't think I have a solution uh, at all, uh, but I fully agree with uh, Phil's uh, comments here. Uh, you know, uh, gone are the days where we could really instill uh, you know, uh, quality through through instilling fear in people, right? I mean, we know that. I mean, come on. I mean, we all know that. And and just because these are nursing home frail residents and uh, we don't feel the urgency of fixing these issues, what healthcare system in U.S. in 21st century wants to rely on a system that bases it on checklist and, and fear factor? I mean, this is such a ridiculously clear issue, which we all know. I know it because many of you have had this conversation with, I'm lucky to know many of you in the panel. We all have agreed on that, is that this is no way in the 21st century with all we know today that, that we are not upgrading how we motivate team. We know that, that, that we are really, we need to, we could do better. And the other issue is that Absolutely. I mean, uh, I wish I had another 40 minutes of uh, session. I would talk more about how we need to separate our skilled and intermediate care. To me, these are two very, very different systems. And most of my comments were really basing on you know, mostly on intermediate care. But yes, people who come from the hospital with only a length of stay of like 10 or 14 days now really belong to a totally different category. Uh, so that, yes, maybe we need to look at a system where they, these are both separated out. I'll tell you what, so I had I mean, another thought. I was thinking of this, if you wouldn't mind. Um, I just had a new hip and I had to go to a rehab in the hospital for a week. And I find, although it's intensely clinical, the amount of blood pressuring and PT and OT per day is only two hours. And what they were doing was some of them not talking properly to me, being surly, uh, sneaking me into a diabetic diet without asking me if I wanted one for a week. And so it wasn't all bad, but of course in COVID, I couldn't leave the room. So it was like really boring. But in terms of certifying them separately, maybe worth a pilot study if you know, it's been a long time since they were put together. I wasn't uh, knowledgeable at, at what they did prior. So maybe they need uh, to pilot it. Dr. Calkins, did you have a comment? Yes, I, I would add um, to your first question about how do we move beyond the mindset of fear from all sorts of threats. Um, I think it ties in with the mindset that we have had of assessing disability and ill health as opposed to focusing on the positive outcomes that we want to see. And if we could shift more of the focus, not all of it, but more of the focus to what are the positive outcomes that we want to see? Those are the things that get rewarded and the rewards reduce the threats from the various partners that are, are you know, that we view as, as being threats, be it the survey process or be it legal, um, that, that that's beginning to put the emphasis on what we want to be working towards. We don't want to work towards just um, not being sick. We want to work towards being 
having high well-being and high quality of life and high meaningful engagement and all of and all of those kinds of things. So that's one sort of concrete example. And a, another sort of example is what is happening in not the CMS codes, but in the building codes and the FGI guidelines. Um, in the last round in 2018, they completely separated out the codes for residential care settings from acute and ambulatory care settings. Prior to that, they all started with the same basic code and then you just wrote all of these exceptions and said, except in a nursing home, you can do this or except in a nursing home, you don't have to do that. So this was a huge shift to pull out and to recognize that these residential settings where people are spending and living weeks, months, years need to be conceptualized really differently. Um, and I think that reflects a big shift and it's beginning to be um, you know, accepted as code in more states and is going to continue to have more of an impact one of the things that we're hoping to um, resolve in the next 21, 20, 20 days with the International Code Council meetings, which are going on right now, is to suggest that every bedroom, 90% of the bedrooms should be private bedrooms uh, in nursing homes, just the way 10 years ago we did it in hospitals. And it was the International Code Council that came out and said in hospitals, in acute care settings, every person deserves a private room. And the hospital industry was up in arms, but we passed it, they passed it. Um, and you see new hospitals being built all of the time, all with private rooms. We can do the same thing in long-term care. So I think looking at the other ways of impacting the system beyond what CMS does and the CMS umbrella is an important strategy to look at. Okay, so we have time for two more committee member questions. So um, we'll go with uh, Gregory Alexander and then after Greg, um, we'll have Jasmine Travers. Hi, thank you so much for your talk today. Um, I'm gonna go with the theme of taking the bite out of the elephant that Karen talked about. Um, um, and But I have a couple of questions, uh, one for Karen and really uh, one for Dr. Nazir. Um, the first is uh, you mentioned, Karen, about medicalizing everything. And so if you were going to take a bite out of that element, what would be the first steps that you would take to do that? Because that these both these questions are about really ingrained institutionalized processes that, um, you know, medicalization is, is a hard thing to change. Where do you even begin to do that? The second point was raised by Dr. Nazir is about meaningful anal analytics and relevant QMs. Again, those are things that have been ingrained and installed and infused into our environment. Um, that So where do you begin to even think about what is meaningful and what is not? And so I pose those two questions to you. Thank you. All right, I'll start. Hi, Gregory. Um, that's why I brought up the dining practice standards. They are something to read. They are full of research citations. They're on the Pioneer Network website right now. They may be in other places, but what I find is uh, for clinical care, clinicians don't wanna change what they think is good care unless clinical studies have been done that have convinced them. That's why that task force formed and why the standard setting organizations themselves said, yes, let's do that. Now, there's a missing link in terms of who's gonna get the word out to all those clinical people, doctors, nurses, dietitians who are working in long-term care. It's been 10 years since those came out. So in terms of just that one thing, I don't know who's going to do that. I don't know what education young people are getting to become a doctor, nurse, dietitian, et cetera. Then there are all these other medical things, but starting with the diets can get people to go, eh, we can liberalize here. Look, the standard setters said we could. They're not gonna listen to the culture change people or the advocates or the residents or family members. They need to get with their own kind. 
Uh, good question. Uh, I appreciate it, Greg. Uh, I'm going to try to merge both those questions uh, and answer them together because they belong together. The thing is that why we do things the way we do them is based on what uh, paint we what, what picture we paint of a society. And uh, by creating quality measures that are so focused on what physician does or what nurse uh, did they do the right thing, did they do the wrong, just to figure out that are people doing the right thing, the wrong thing, you're basically setting up a very uh, clear culture that you don't trust them. And that is an absolute issue in our healthcare system where everything is towards being a policeman. We want to make sure that people are doing the right thing, make sure they're not doing the wrong thing, make sure they are really up to task. I think that's the wrong approach. Why did we need to go into that direction? Because we stripped away passion and motivation from our team members first through a very cumber, 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 uh, cumbersome compliance-driven system. So because we created that system, we created team members who acted that way, who really wanted to game the system because they were not have, you know, they were really not getting their mission and purpose through the system. So that is why we now we need to police them, right? So it's really basically our own doing why we need the color quality measures. And by the way, how many publications in health affairs and JAMA we're gonna need before we realize that none of these macro MIPS and APMs are not working. Other than a very focused model, which is physician-led ACL, none of these uh, metric systems are helping us really even save money. Forget about person-centered care and quality of life. They aren't even getting us to make uh, consistently care be cheaper. Why we continue to stick with them when they're taking so much time and motivation away from them? Everybody's focused on compliance. Everybody's focused on getting their measures numbers up so they can look good, they can get reimbursed better. We have created a big monster of a problem. We need to get back in creating teams that really care, motivating them through quality measures which are person-centered. And a simple one example for that is what, which I just gave is like, if you go to a restaurant, do you really care about your chef's operational performance or you really want a steak you like? So really understanding that did people get the right care by asking simple questions like, so it's really not focusing on quality of care, but quality of life, right? So I think our quality measures probably should be about, hey, are you having fun here? Do you have something fun to do? Like, do you have good friends? Like, I do not know, I'm not the expert on that. But to me, being a physician and a clinician and now a chief medical officer of a large organization, these issues are so clear that CMS is not helping me in my job at this point. You know, I have to go and make sure that the CM, that everybody's doing what CMS wants them to do. And then I have to go and train people to do the right thing, right? I mean, I have to do my job like three times now because of all these distracting structures that we have created. So I wish we could strip away those things so I, that my job becomes easy. It's a selfish probably reason. I want the system to get better, but we have created a lot of complexity over complexity. Uh, so we need to really overhaul all of that. And so before we move to our next speaker, we have one last question from the committee from uh, Jasmine Travers. I actually was going to ask something related to dismantling the current systems that are in place. And um, that was kind of just now answered by Arif. Thank you. Regards to how do we undo these systems and really um, just motivate a culture change within nursing homes outside of what we currently have, you know, keeping and supporting nursing and, homes. And, and Jasmine, if you don't mind, I, I would like to answer that. I mean, I would like for everyone to read, uh, uh, you know, I'm sure you all, most of you have read it already, Don Berwick's article, Moral Determinants of Health, uh, published in JAMA Viewpoint, I think last November. And, you know, it was one of the most, uh, you know, in many ways changed me in that article. And they talk about that for us to dismantle this path of repair shock, repair shock culture we have created in our country, which is so reactive and so driven by medical diseases. It is beyond the power of policymakers. It's beyond the power of money. It is us morally getting an awakening and our commitment to doing the right thing. So as a society, we really have to think what good care are we, how, how effective care are we providing for, for our older seniors and frail. So I think it's a very, very important thing that it's, it's, it's gonna take way more than just simple band-aids or policy shifts and all that. We really as a community have to rethink it in a very, very whole, uh, a new way in, in my opinion. Okay, and I see that Dr. Calkins put some comments in the chat. Did you want to mention those before we move to our next speaker? Nope, no, we can keep okay. going. Okay, okay. So our next speaker um, is Dr. Uh, Joseph Auslander, who is Professor of Geriatric Medicine, Senior Advisor to the Dean for Geriatrics um, at the Charles E. Smith College of Medicine, Florida Atlantic University. And I'll turn it over now to Dr. Auslander. Thank you. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. Um, I've uh, dedicated my career of close to 40 years to improving care of uh, older people, mainly in uh, long-term care settings. Uh, and I 
wanted to take a uh, broad approach to uh, answering uh, the questions uh, that were being asked. So I'm gonna give you some thoughts on what I perceive as pressing problems and some solutions. And you'll hear that there has been a considerable overlap in, in what I'm gonna say and the, uh, and, and the speakers you just heard uh, have said. Next slide. Uh, I do have disclosures. Uh, I've been working on a program to reduce hospitalizations of nursing home residents called Interact. Uh, the relevant disclosures here are uh, the, the, uh, the uh, royalties I receive from that, uh, as well as uh, I work um, on, uh, for uh, an ISNP uh, longevity health plan. Uh, all of these are, are through my university and uh, approved by financial conflicts of interest uh, plans. Next. So I wanted to, I, I can't do a talk on uh, nursing home care nowadays without thanking the heroes who have been literally uh, working under extraordinarily difficult circumstances, risking their lives, risking the health of their families and taking care of uh, really vulnerable people uh, during a pandemic. And we, we really need to thank them and, and pay attention to their concerns. Next. So I, I'm, I'm predicating this uh, presentation on the fact that there will always be a need for institutional long-term care. There's a lot of talk about uh, community uh, resources in the community, but my view is, is that no matter how much is invested in home and community-based services, some people have inadequate supports for their needs and are not safe in a non-institutional setting. And I see that every day. Next. So the first problem is quality. Um, many of our country's nursing homes provide very high quality of care, but many others do not and a smaller number of nursing homes provide care that is not what any of us would want for our families, loved ones, and ourselves. Second, next one. The second problem is uh, that's been alluded to quite a bit already is that financial, regulatory, and legal liability incentives and disincentives are often misaligned and in some cases incentivize the wrong behavior. Next one. Um, Dr. Bob Keen was uh, one of my main mentors and I know he's mentored other people um, who are uh, involved. He, he used to say all the time that a nursing home is an oxymoron. Most do not have enough nursing and most are nothing like a home. And I think you've heard a lot about that already. Next one. And the fourth problem is one that I've focused on since I've been a clinician in a nursing home setting. And that is that the nursing home population is heterogeneous and the physical structure reimbursement and quality measures do not account for this heterogeneity. There are short stayers who I now call patients and long stayers who I call residents. In many facilities, short stay post-acute nursing home patients are mixed together with long-term nursing home residents not a pleasant experience for many. Uh, the financial viability often depends on using dollars generated by short stay patients to cover the costs of long stay residents. And some quality measures that are relevant to post acute short stay patients are irrelevant or even inappropriate for some long stay residents. Next. So what are some solutions? Well, fundamental to improving quality is improving the workforce. Um, there are many ideas, uh, loan repayment programs, competitive wages, career ladders for nursing assistants, and many others that, uh, uh, that the National Academy has published in their publications and, um, as well as others. Uh, this is fundamental, uh, uh, further develop robust, reliable and valid quality measures for short stay, short stay patients and long stay residents and train surveyors to use them consistently. And I agree that these measures should 
include person-centered measures. Um, third, to disseminate clinical practice tools that are based on evidence and expert recommendations. And I agree with what was said before. And also efficiently embed them in electronic medical records so that staff can be reminded without alert fatigue to do the right thing at the right time and to document it. And that's uh, the goal of uh, the Interact program as well as other tools that are available. The next one. So what about the, the uh, perverse incentives that are in the system? Well, I'm a believer in value-based care, um, what I've called enlightened capitation. We pay for quality, not the quantity of care. This requires reliable and valid quality measures to protect from inadequate care. Uh, institutional need, special needs plans, ISNPs, are an example of a promising model that has skin in the game for everybody involved. Um, there are egregious issues going on with owners and management, and some of the laws need to be changed. And we need to limit liability for bad outcomes in very sick patients, uh, as was mentioned before. We're dealing with complex patients and they get sick. Next. So what about the environment? I totally agree with what's been discussed. Um, we should uh, go from the stark picture on the top there to more home-like environments that you saw several examples of. Uh, they're really remarkable um, and, and uh, the industry should evolve that way, whether it's short stay or long stay. They need to be person-centered, but I also would say that the, all this discussion about medicalization, you can go too far. Uh, these people need high quality medical care. They need clinicians around. So there needs, in these home-like environments, there needs to be adequate nursing and medical staff, but they can be in the background. So it doesn't look like a small hospital. Next. <clears throat> and finally, about the heterogeneity of the population. Um, I think that it would be good to think about evolving two separate types of care settings, one for post-acute, and one for long-term and staff and reimburse those facilities at appropriate levels. And then, as I mentioned before, to further develop quality measures um, that, can, that are person-centered and can be used in these different um, environments and train surveyors uh, to use them consistently. So I'll finish there and there's plenty of time for questions. Great. Uh, thanks, Dr. Auslander. And so now I will um, turn it over to or look for questions from the committee. So committee members, please use your raise hand function. And also remember to check your mute status and also uh, to turn your cameras on when you're asking your question. So our first question comes from um, Marilyn Rance. Hi, Joe. Hello, Marilyn. Good to see you. Um, Good to be seen. You know, you mentioned you mentioned some person-centered QMs as an example of, of um, that they really need, the QMs need to have person-centered focus. Um, but give me some more specifics of what you're thinking. Uh, what, what would these actually look like? Um, and I, you know, while I agree about all the survey or training and focusing things, but, but it would be helpful to hear your point of view on ideas of what you would actually think about measuring? It's a great question. I knew someone would ask that question. I, I think the, the best work that's been done on this was done by Bob and Rosalie Kane. Um, and uh, I do think it depends on the level of cognition of the resident uh, to ask certain types of questions. Having said that, um, there are things like, do you, are there activities here that you enjoy doing? Are you able to choose the times that you get a bath or eat a meal? You have adequate choice of food. Um, and people who can answer those types of questions as, as 
uh, Arif said, do you have fun? Uh, it, so those types of questions that can be asked of people with uh, uh, adequate cognition. And then I think uh, family members' perceptions. I've learned, you know, as a clinician, sometimes family members can be very irritating, but I've learned that they know what's going on and I listen to them. And I think uh, asking family members those type of questions when residents can't answer them um, would be a good idea. I'm not an expert in that development of those type of questions, but I think those are, those are the things that might be important. I'm, I'm thinking about, so, so, so if I was in this situation, so when I, when I made rounds, I, I used to, I, I used, my, my, some of the residents would say, can I have a drink? Can I have a cocktail at night? And I used to go join them for a cocktail. If somebody doesn't let me have a cocktail, uh, uh, you know, with my, with, with, with the evening meal once in a while, that would not be good. Similarly, someone mentioned diets before. Uh, when I became a medical director of a large institution, I took over from a cardiologist. And I had 95-year-old people asking me if they could eat an egg or a hot dog. So when I, when I talk about myself, it's the way I'd like to treat other people. If you're my doctor or you're my nurse, you're taking care of me, and I ask you if I can eat a kosher hot dog, you say yes, and you adjust my medication. Uh, those are the kinds of things that I think are, are, are important to people when they're in a nursing home. Okay, uh, Karen, did you have a comment to make? Hi, Marilyn. Uh, I wanted to chime in just momentarily on this for those people who haven't seen the artifacts of culture change. You're asking about quality of life, quality measures. Those are concrete items. And they're not based on resident interview. They are facts of the building. Do do does a dog live here? Can you sleep in? Uh, in general, a uh, home that's willing to fill out the artifacts, which has about 138 items on it, you can find a lot of concrete things in there. Is there a culture change section in employee evaluations, including the administrator and everybody else? And so they're very concrete, they may be, uh, some things that might be good for uh, some pilot study. Not that they ever would become quality measures, but they are at least something to think about. Okay. Uh, our next question from our committee comes from David Grabowski. Great. Thanks, Reggie. And thanks, Joe. It's, it's great to see you. And I really appreciated uh, your uh, remarks today. I wanted to ask you a little bit about your um, conception there. I think it was in enlightened capitation was, did I get that right? <laughs> um, and it seemed to encompass the, the Medicare side and the clinical side. Is there a role for this kind of capitated model to also include uh, the long-term care side and, and post-acute and what, what, what might that look like? The ISNIP obviously that's the clinical model directed at long stay nursing home residents, but it's, but it's their clinical care that's in that bundle. And is there a way to think about a, a more blended model? A, a blended model between- Between the clinical care. and, and long-term care. Well, I think, so, so when I say, so when I spoke in other countries, um, they didn't understand the reimbursement system. They asked me, well, what do you think it should be? And that's what I've been using the term enlightened capitation. What I mean by that is, uh, is getting away from fee for service, which incentivizes people to do things for money that are often not in the best interest of pe the people they serve um, and, uh, and focus more on, on quality. So I'm in favor of some form of, of, of uh, capitation, but it has to be guarded by quality measures. And I, I think the answer to your question is the quality measures need to be different um, for those different populations. That's what I was alluding to. So I, I, I think for me, it, it means the same thing, whether it's post-acute short-stay people or long-stay long people, capitated model. It's just that the the quality measures, you, you, you incentivize people based on quality, not on money, and you measure quality that matters to the, to the residents. I, I, don't, I can't answer any more specifically than that. 
Yeah, and I, and I, 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 I see where you're going. I, I would just push you a little bit. Are, are the quality measures there yet to, to do that kind of system? And I think they're on the clinical side, yes. I, I, I wonder a little bit more. I'm, I'm, I'd be curious to get your perspective, Joe. Do you think the, um, the, the, the measures are, are there? No, not even on the clinical side. I don't think okay. the clinical measures are, are adequate yet. But uh, certainly, that's what we were just discussing. I think whether it's the kind of thing that Bob and Rosalie Kane did for interviewing nursing home residents about what's important to you, or whether it's artifacts or some combination, I, I, I don't know. But I think I, I would strongly recommend that that be a major focus of developing these kind of measures. It, it's, I, I think it's critical to improving uh, care of our, our population. Great. Okay, so I don't see any other questions from committee members. So I'll, I'll pose a, um, a question to Dr. Hauslander. And it's the same question that I posed to the, to the earlier panel. So I, um, I, I was happy to hear your, your sort of recognition of the heterogeneity in terms of you know, how, how we age. But as um, folks sort of navigate healthcare and get to, to nursing home care, we, we note that um, the significant influence of, of, of race and socioeconomic resources. So how do we ensure that as we are sort of thinking about quality and measuring quality, that we also ensure that as solutions are introduced, that they are not exacerbating the disparities that are there because we know that the, the experience of nursing home care is sort of racially patterned and socioeconomically patterned. Oh, you're absolutely correct. And I, 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 uh, I did, uh, there's a, a lot of evidence, uh, as you know, for what you just said. And, and uh, um, we're going to be uh, caring for an increasingly diverse population and, and, and with an increasingly diverse workforce. So I think that uh, the person-centered environment has to take into account uh, that type of diversity. So when you're, if you're trying to develop the quality measures that, that we've been alluding to that are softer, that relate to quality of life, they have to take into account that diversity. And that's, that's one of the real, real challenges because different, uh, cu different cultures uh, di uh, look at things very, very differently. So I think that's a that's an, another absolutely critical point. Thanks, thanks for bringing it up. Okay, so we have uh, I see one one more hand um, from Tamara from the committee. Uh, uh, Tamara, you're muted. Sorry, you can't stop video and open the video and unmute at the same time. <laughs> um, Good to see you, Joe, and thank you for those remarks. I'm going to be a little bit persistent following up on something you said in response to David and ask, um, you know, you said, I completely understand that the big gap is in sort of patient-centered outcome measures um, and that we're, uh, we're, we may not be there yet in terms of having good enough measures for a payment model. I want to push back a little bit on what you said about the clinical measures not being there. When I look at the clinical measures, of course, you know, we find fault with them. We know that they can be gamed in some ways, but in the end, they, um, you know, we started developing these back in the 1980s, right? I mean, we've been working on those clinical measures for nursing home uh, clinical outcomes for so long. And I think many would argue when you look at, you know, hospital care versus nursing home care, you know, look across the spectrum, the nursing home measures might be, you know, more developed and more uh, 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 sort of validated than um, what we see in any other sector. So I'm really curious. I mean, my because my my stance is often like we've worked on those. There, it's a it's a process. It's not an end. We're never going to ever say these measures are perfect now, and we're not going to change them. Right. So I guess you know. I want to bridge that to what you said. What do you think is really missing in those clinical measures in terms of, you know, actually attaching them to payment or being calling them good enough for now as we continue to refine them? Well, it is a good, great question. And th thanks for asking it. So 
I, 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 th I think that um, I, I'm a believer. I understand there's a lot of controversy about the, the readmission measure, but I, I believe that that's, that's good. It can be made, a, made somewhat better. I think that's a good one. Um, on, on, the, on the other hand, um, what I see every day um, is egregious prescribing um, uh, that is uh, harming people all the time. And, uh, it, and I, I, there's the measures of uh, antipsychotics and uh, very, very crude measures. And I would like to see a system that could uh, get what I've called in writing low hanging fruit. Um, so for example, someone's being over treated with antihypertensive medications. They're on four of them, 94 year old on four antihypertensive medications. They're gonna fall down and they're gonna break their hip and they're gonna die. Um, and similarly, uh, over treating diabetes. Every time you make somebody hypoglycemic, they lose brain cells, their dementia is gonna become worse. So I, I think there are measures um, with, with better data systems that can get a little more granular that would really, really help. And I think um, those er area of polypharmacy is, is one of them. On the other hand, things like urinary tract infection, I, I, I still don't think that people can define that uh, well enough for a quality measure. Thank okay, you, so everyone. thanks so much for the, oh, I was going to turn it over to you, Betty, is first going to thank all of our speakers and all of our committee members for a stimulating discussion, and I'll turn it back over to our committee chair. Yeah, thank you so much. Obviously, such a great conversation and such important issues about quality of life today. So thank you, Dr. Tucker Seeley, and to all of our speakers for your very thoughtful contributions to this work. Again, as a reminder, everyone can submit resident, family, and nursing home staff experiences, as well as watch a recording of today's webinar on the study webpage. We appreciate everyone's support as a committee as we work to improve the quality of care in nursing homes, and we really appreciate you being with us today. Thank you so much. <laughs>